I'm Dr. Deeksha Pandey, additional professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, KMC Manipal, and I'm also the in charge of Urogynecology subdivision in our department. And today again, we have come here to discuss yet another interesting case of utero-vaginal prolapse. It is a little different case from others, and we are going to have some different discussion today with Dr. Ritvika, who is going to present that case. And to facilitate or moderate that case, I have here today with me Dr. Richa Choksi, who is an assistant professor in the Department of OBG in KMC Manipal. So, Ritvika, are yes, you ready? Sir. Yes. Okay. Today, I'll be presenting the case of a 43-year-old female premenopausal. Uh, she is a resident of Beltanda and a social welfare typist by occupation. And her parity index is para 2 living to abortion 2. Uh, with two previous normal vaginal births and her marital life is 20 years. She complained with, uh, uh, she came with the complaints of mass per vaginal since four years now. And her mass was increasing, gradually increasing in size and she says it's produced on lying down and increases during the day when she was working or uh, during, uh, if she gets any cough. Uh, and she was evaluated for the same in back in 2017 and uh, she was advised an option of a surgery but she was a little hesitant and she went ahead with the option of um, Kegels exercises, pelvic floor muscle exercises. And after that, she was lost to follow up. And, and just tell me, Ritvika, one thing. What did you tell me? What is her age now? 43 years old. 43. That time she was 39 years yes. of age. So we'll discuss this also, that what kind of surgery was advised to her or you would advise when a lady comes to you who is 39 years with prolapse. Yes. Okay. First, let's discuss the symptoms. Okay. So now she's 43 years old. Four years later, she comes back with the same complaint of mass per vaginum, but she says now it's gradually increased in size in the uh, period of four years. And right now, the other thing that is bothering her is she's having complaints of urinary uh, symptoms. Like she ha uh, she's unable to pass urine easily. She has to deposit her mass back uh, if she has to pass urine, but she doesn't have any history of infection or anything. But this is bothering her, so she's come back again. So, so basically, she has. Uh, prolapse, mass per vaginum, mm -hmm. and urinary, urinary symptoms. symptoms. Maybe this time, because she has not sought any treatment for last four years, maybe now she has come only because of urinary, urinary symptoms. This time. Yeah, so that is more bothersome for, yes. for her right now. So, if we stop you here and discuss about, so urinary symptoms are a kind of anterior, anterior compartment, compartment problems. So, what other anterior compartment? Can you enumerate all the problems which a patient of prolapse will present when we say that it is anterior compartment, prolapse or anterior compartment problem? Yes, ma'am. Uh, if in anterior compartment, mostly it's urinary symptoms, mm -hmm. and that can be like incontinence type or obstructive type. In early stages of prolapse, they have incontinence type symptoms like stress urinary incontinence or urge urinary incontinence. But later, when the mass is increased in size, uh, then they have more, mostly obstructive kind of symptoms. And then they have to do finger splinting or deposit their mass back uh, if they have to urinate. And they might have recurrent urinary tract infections also. That can be a cause. And uh, mm -hmm. so why in the initial part they have uh, incontinence kind of symptoms? Mom, uh, because of the prolapse, uh, there's a lax laxity at the blood and neck. And uh, that is the reason they might have stress urinary. And when abdominal pressure increases when they're coughing, the pressure is not transmitted uh, similarly in the neck and the so blood and neck, neck also. also. So and in the later part, why is it present with obstructive symptoms? Uh, in the later part, because of uh, uh, increased the, the mass, there is mass effect and obstruction. So, so, so in the initial part, when the uh, mass per vaginum or the cystocele is less, because there is laxity of the tissue, so there is laxity on the blood and neck also. So they usually present with urgent incontinence, stress incontinence. But as the size of the cystocele increases, the mass, the cystocele itself obstructs the bladder neck. So, uh, there are obstructive symptoms and due to the retention of urine, there is recurrent cystitis. Okay. You understand well, that urethrocele, urethra remains at its place and the bladder starts bulging. So, there is thinking of the neck of the oh, bladder. Right. What is de novo stress incontinence? If you are not able to tell, then Richard will explain what is de novo stress incontinence for the sake of viewers. So initially, when the patients initially they, in the initial part of uh, presenting with mass per vaginum or cystocele, they present with urinary incontinence symptoms. But later, as the size of the mass increases, there are obstructive symptoms, and suddenly these stress urinary incontinence or urge incontinence they disappear. So when the patient they present to us with mass per vaginum, some maybe obstructive symptoms. So we offer them surgical repair, vaginal hysterectomy with pelvic floor repair, 
and later on in the post op period they suddenly they their uh, symptoms of sui or urge incontinence they reappear as soon as we deposit the bladder uh-huh. back in the pelvis and tissues are already little relax so this is known as de novo stress so it is very important that whenever you are taking the history you have to ask her that did she have any incontinence system a few years ago okay. because patient might be thinking that any way she would have forgot it that it happened once now it is not a bother for her so you have to because this is one of the prediction factors or predicting factors that patient will develop the de novo stress syndrome incontinence after prolapse repairs or not okay previous history of stress yes. syndrome incontinence yes. this patient she didn't have any history of recurrent urinary tract infections mm-hmm. or any um symptoms of stress urinary incontinence or urge urinary incontinence even initially ma'am and she didn't have any central compartment symptoms also she didn't have any coital difficulties or any wide discharge per vaginum and no post no evidence of posterior compartment symptoms also no defecatory disturbances and no loss of weight or appetite also and her menstrual history she has regular cycles and last menstrual period was 10th july and uh, she, now she had come to the ovary with an obstructive uh, uh, urinary retention kind of symptoms where she had to do finger splinting and in the opd we advised her a pessary for the time being to, uh, like to wait for the surgery at a later date because she wanted to decide later and sh- she went back home with the pessary in situ and then four days later she came back to us now uh, saying she had retention of urine and there was like acute retention of urine and then we had to uh, give her the option of surgery ma'am okay so this is a very important case ratika where you will for your life time you will remember because you have seen and taken yes. this case that ill fitting pessary is one of the important causes of urinary retention okay so it's not always because of prolapse but it is an iatrogenic also sometimes okay if you are not putting pessary properly or if the size of the pessary usually is little larger they can present with urinary incontinence so in our hospital in our setup what precautions we take when we put a pessary then and do we tell patient something before we send her back no you have no, put the pessary, pessary. Mm-hmm. so as soon as you put the pessary and you are happy that pessary is okay do you send them home no the we will ask them to pass urine yes. before they leave yes. the hospital to see if it's in place and if everything is all right so two things can happen when the patient goes to uh, pass urine one thing if the pessary is small, small it will come, come out, out as soon as yeah. patient exerts pressure or the other thing patient if it is a bigger size pessary it is very difficult to find out the exact size. size even the best of the person the most experienced person can go wrong sometimes okay so if it is little bigger size pessary it might cause obstructive symptoms so it is very important that before you send the patient home mm-hmm. you just tell her to go and void once to see both the things pessary should not come out also and this mm-hmm. we should not cause difficulty in voiding us so this patient you told that she came back to the hospital after four days of insertion of pessary and acute urinary retention mm-hmm. so what did you do for this patient when she presented uh, when she came we uh, examined her and removed the pessary ma'am so uh, this is one of the causes of you have to remember any other thing so one can be a cystocele so three causes i want you to remember from today's discussion of acute urinary retention one can be prolapse yes. okay obstructive kind of symptoms when it is there it itself can cause urinary retention second is ill fitting pessary third thing can you tell me something related to pelvic floor disorder some iatrogenic cause like pessary when you have done something and patient suddenly presents with acute urinary retention so after what kind of surgery patient can suddenly okay. uh, and transvaginal tissue so tension free tension free so any kind of anti incontinent procedure or we have you can you could have done any abdominal procedure anything we are not discussing but it is such a delicate balance of continence and so retention that uh, if you have put something little bit extra you have done so patient can come so that's also one of the iatrogenic causes and it is important for you to ask the history of surgery anything else was significant in the history Uh, she was uh, milk or vomit, no medical history, no history of hypertension, diabetes, or chronic cough or anything. No pelvic surgeries, previous, no previous pelvic surgeries. So, uh, can we move on to examination? Yes, ma'am. I'll summarize before that. She's a 43-year-old pre-menopausal woman uh, with parity index prior to living to abortion to two previous normal deliveries, and now complained with mass per vaginal since four years. 
physical exam. She is moderately built now. BMI is 21.5, and uh, her gait is normal. No uh, pallor, icterus, cyanosis, or any evidence of lymphadenopathy. And uh, chest is clear. Respiratory system also is quite clear. And per per abdomen, she was soft nodular, no mass palpable, and no evidence of ascites now. Local examination. Uh, on in, on inspection, the external genitalia look normal, vulva, labia measure, and minor look normal, no atrophy, and uh, no signs of excoriation also. And the mass was like 4 into 5 centimeters in size without any evidence of decubitus ulcers. On, but the cervix looked little hypertrophy now. And cough impulse was visualized, and no evidence of any stress urinary incontinence. On palpation, uh, the cervix was uh, firm, and all the inspectory findings were confirmed, and the mass. Uh, uh, like I couldn't get above the mass, and so it was what degree? It was, it was not it was not prostentia. It was third degree degree prolapse, and uh, and no alteration indication of bleeding on touch. Now, and I could feel that the surface was a little elongated also. And on first second examination, there was cystocene, mm -hmm. but no minimal rectocele. And after depositing the mass back for bimanual examination. The uh, uterus is normal sized, retroverted, no foreignal fullness or uh, no tenderness also. And the tone of levator anae is uh, 2 plus um, and uh, grade, grade 2. And thickness of the perineal body was at 3 into 3 centimeters. Per rectum, there is no rectus. Did you do POPQ also? Oh, pop yes, ma'am, I've done POPQ. Don't tell me the details of POPQ. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to do, I think Richard, we have discussed many times about POPQ. What I want Ratvika to tell the important features. What is the stage and what are the components? What is your interpretation of this? I'll only tell the important the POPQ examination. Point B on anti-vaginal was plus 5 mm -hmm. and point C is plus 7 and point D was minus 4. Mm -hmm. So what is the interpretation? What are the component? One is something called global pelvic floor relaxation. So it looks like in this patient, when you are saying that every compartment Compartment's was not relaxed, there were some specific points which were there. So what is your interpretation? Um, point point C is uh, huh. is point C is outside and, and point D is still inside. Right. That means what is it? That means it's cervical elongation. Yes, it is a case of cervical elongation. Which you told in your palpation also. Yes, ma'am. That you could feel could the feel. tubular 4 to 5 centimeters. Yes, so it is corresponding with that. Yes, ma'am. So any time for the bigness, if you have a confusion, this measurement helps you to prove your point that actually it is a case of cervical elongation. Then though point B in anterior vaginal wall, we call it point B in anterior vaginal wall, but I keep on telling that it corresponds to cystosis. So actually she had a cystosis also. So basically this patient presents with prolapse, what we call prolapse here means a cystocele and elongated Elongate. cervix. There is no interest in, there is no interest. Right. So it is stage 3. Stage 3 prolapse, yes. that's also if you put it in stage 3. So what about the management? You said that, so we'll discuss the management from when she was 39 years old and she presented with uh, the case of where she presented as you know, a case of prolapse. So uh, did you mention in your examination one more point I wanted to discuss what kind of defect it was, whether it was a central defect or it was a lateral defect? Um, this is a lateral, lateral defect, ma'am. So how will you differentiate between a central cystocene and a lateral cystocene? Um, based on rogue Yes. Ah, so depending on the presence of rogue in the anterior vaginal wall, if the rogue are present and still there is cystocene, then what does that mean? Then it's central. Then it's a lateral cystocene because the rogue are present. And if the rogue are absent, then there is central cystocene. So if you understand what causes central and lateral cystocene, that becomes easy for you to understand. So usually lateral cystocene means laterally the pubocervical fascia is detached from the white line. Mm -hmm. That means it is lateral cystocene. Okay? Central cystocene means it is a global attenuation of pubocervical fascia. Okay. So central cystocene means what will happen? There will be a bulge. When patient coughs, there will be a smooth bulge. Okay, smooth bulge. smooth bulge, central bulge, and in lateral cystocele, there will be you will see that something is coming out, but it won't be like a balloon bulge. So, there will be rugosities, there is something is lax, 
when it is full with urine you can that becomes more prominent but otherwise you will be able because the tissues are not weak here tissues are broken from the side okay so if somebody asks you i'll make it the point very clear for you if somebody asks you how to differentiate between a central cystocele and a lateral cystocele first thing is lateral cystocele is usually a result of trauma during childbirth while red Uh, lateral, uh, sorry, by central cystocele. Did I say correctly? Lateral cystocele is because of the trauma, trauma related child. to childbirth, because of the avulsion of tissue from the bite line. Central cystocele is usually there is weakness of tissue and attenuation of tissue. Tissue has become very weak, like a cloth becomes weak and then it bulges out. Okay. okay. And on examination, so if we see the age group, usually lateral cystocele is present in younger age group. Okay. Central cystocele patient will be presenting at sixty years, seventy years, and eighty years. Okay, because that is because of tissue yes. attenuation. Here, the time interval since the last childbirth to presenting symptoms. That means the patient is young, and that gap will be sm uh, smaller. smaller. While in central cystocele, this gap will be a lot. Patient will say that I did about thirty years ago, forty years ago, okay. because it is not much related to the childhood trauma. Related trauma. Little trauma will be there. But not direct trauma to the white line and the tissues attached to that. Then, as Dr. The lateral cystocele may it may present as an isolated effect. Also. Yes, yes. Whereas yes. central cell, uh, central cystocele will generally present with urinary prolapse. Yes. So it can be just and it can be asymmetrical also. So if we say examination finding, the most important examination finding, as Dr. Richa said, that presence or absence of rugosities. So when the tissue is just dropping down, the structure of tissue is not changing. So rugosities will be normal vaginal rugosities will be maintained in lateral cystocele, while a smooth bulge you will see in central cystocele. Then we do a test with you. It's it has lost its significance, but long time ago we were taught to do a test like you put a sponge holding forceps and put it, or you can just open the cuscose blade inside and tell patient to cough. When it fixes the lateral structures, then if still the on cough when you have fixed the lateral attachments. Then also, if there is a smooth bulge outside, that is a central cystocele. But if it is not there, it is a lateral cystocele. So, is there a difference? And why do we want to uh, discuss so much about whether it is a lateral cystocele or a central cystocele? Does the management differ according to that? Yes, ma'am. The uh, as the pubic cervical patients detach from the white line in the lateral cystocele, just this bladder buttressing along with vaginal hysterectomy. Will not benefit the patient. The patient will still have the lateral cystocele component. Now, either we have to do lateral. We have to attach that fascia back to the white line. Okay. Now the problem is attaching this fascia to white line is not very easy. Vaginal it is very difficult. Even abdominally, you have to. It's not easy or laparoscopically. Okay. So the thing is, the um, if you see the guidelines, okay, even as early as late as 2019, AUGS guidelines specifically mention. So if you have supported the apex, it is basically at the line uh, level of apex only. So if you have supported the vagina apex properly, that means you do not need to repair the lateral defect. Okay, but apical fixation is very very important if you see the lateral. If you do not do Patient will come with the recurrence. Okay. okay, and why it is it is also important to prognosticate the disease. See, every time you know what is the recurrence rate of prolapse. Chances that patient will once you do a surgery for patient, what is the recurrence overall rate? It's very high. It's up to forty percent rate of recurrence. So rate of recurrence of prolapse surgery is very high. So what happens in which? So when you are telling the counseling the patient. It's very important for them you to explain it to patient that because she has lateral cystocele, the chances of recurrence. First thing, she is young; she has more years to live. Yeah. So forty, fifty years, where uh, as compared to a lady who comes to you who is already eighty-five years. So if you do surgery, hopefully the remaining part of her life she will be symptom-free. But if you are operating in your patient at forty-three year old, she has a forty years lifespan still to go ahead. Mm -hmm. So there is a chance of recurrence. And then there is lateral defect because the tissues are broken, and we do not have in modern urogynecology also we do not have a um, this kind of standard technique to repair this defect. You have to explain this to patient that for these women chances of recurrence recurrence is high. That's why we promote them to because they are young patient, they have a long life ahead, they are active usually. 
we tell them to at least support the activate other muscles. So go for pelvic floor pelvic muscle. Floor. Like if there is an injury in you, you tell the uh, surrounding muscles to become more strong. strong. So even if there is a defect in tissue, if you tell, if you teach the patient to activate the other muscles, she will not have complaints of prolapse. So your patient initially she presented at 39 years of age with the uh, prolapse. So what will be the ideal treatment for such a patient? With surgery will you also know? In young patients like 39 years old, I think for other girls would be a better option. And why more so in this patient? Um, because she has because a complete she has cervical, cervical elongation yeah. also. Yeah, then for the girls, cervical amputation would be a good choice for her. So you said that when she came initially, she was told, though she was advised for surgery, I'm hoping that she was told to undergo cervical amputation and for the surgery. But whatever surgery was, she was not ready to undergo that. And then she was told that you do pelvic floor muscle training. Do you think for these kind of women that cervix is long, pelvic floor muscle training will help? No, in cervical elongation, pelvic floor exercises are not of great help. Yes, because the tissue has increased. Mm -hmm. It has become hypertrophic or hypoplastic, whatever. A 3 centimeter cervix has become 78 mm -hmm. centimeters. So you need to shorten it. When some uh, tissues have undergone hypertrophy, with exercise you cannot decrease it. Her symptoms, maybe cystocele symptoms, MP compartment symptoms, she might benefit. But that mass feeling, she will never be cured of just with the head work. And you told that I don't know what kind of pelvic floor muscle training she was doing because now also you said that her Oxford modified Oxford grade is just yeah. too. Yeah. We don't know what was the grade that time. And um, we keep on discussing in all our videos and all our discussions that it is very important to tell her the importance of continuous training of pelvic floor. It's not that once you have told 10 days patient does and she's not benefited. You have to keep on calling her for follow up see that whether she is doing it right or she is doing it wrong and keep on adding more and more difficult exercises because initially when she comes for the first time she might not understand, understand. also and we do not tell her also very difficult kind of exercises mm -hmm. so it is a continuous process she came four years back and was lost to lost her that definitely is not going to work and the point here today what Richard was trying to emphasize that the pelvic floor muscle training is not of much help for a case of so like the elongation. Elongation. Same as for pessary. Mm -hmm. Pessary also. Because the ligaments, the pessary basically supports the ring of ligaments. What do you call that ring of ring of ligaments? The pericervical ring of ligaments, whatever. That's actually okay because she, this patient does not have any entrosy. So mostly her ligaments are broken from here and there and actually not lax. So if those ligaments are totally gone and everything is drooping down, then you support it with something which replaces that pericervical ring. In those cases, cervical pessary or vaginal pessary is of more help as compared to a case of cervical elongation. Because here again, you put the pessary, maybe cystocin will be reduced a little bit, but she will keep on having the feeling which she is having because of her elongated cervix. And the same thing happened with this patient mm -hmm. uh, when we examined her uh, when she came with extension of urine. Actually, the cervical elongation part was coming through the uh, yes, follow the pessary. Yes. So you cannot help that. You have to offer that. So if you do not educate the patient, patient loses faith. She, it's okay. If you explain, even after that, if patient opts for non-surgical intervention, but you have to explain it to her mm -hmm. that it might mm -hmm. not work because you are saying that I am doing giving it to you. Let her try. Let her come back to you. But explanation is very important, and you can explain only when the things are clear in your mind. Yes. Okay. So have you already done surgery for her? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What surgery you did? We have done a vaginal hysterectomy for her mm -hmm. and an anterior corporeal Yes. Anterior corporeal we have done. So she did not require a perineurophy or um, intrusive okay. surgery okay. because those components. So we do not have a blanket kind of treatment. We used to say some years ago the treatment for prolapses, ward mayos. Mm -hmm. And when I was an undergraduate, our teachers used to teach us that we have to tell an exam that word that anterior corporeal vaginal hysterectomy, posterior corporeal vaginal So that does not uh, have much significance in today's world. We have to see what compartment individualized. Yes, treatment. So from today's discussion, if I tell you that 
what three or four important points you would tend to our viewers other than subscribe our channel? What would be those three take home messages? Uh, Ma'am, one is to ask about history of stress urinary incontinence and in previously, mm -hmm. if she has any stress urinary incontinence, to again to cater to the treatment. Second thing is if she has cervical elongation incontinence, then pelvic floor exercises or uh, pessary wouldn't be of great help. Yes. Second thing is that. And third thing is how to differentiate between uh, anterior compartment symptoms if they're incontinence or obstructive mm -hmm. and, and examination what Richard told you how to differentiate between lateral types and, of yes systems. lateral and central defects and the management yes I think that's enough for today's discussion so soon we'll come back with some more interesting cases and a different kind of discussion because prolapse is such a vast topic that there are so many things to be discussed in one discussion, it is just impossible to discuss everything which is important. So as and when we are getting patients and we are getting different types of complaints, we are discussing that. So hope to see you soon and keep watching us. Yes, subscribe to Thank you.